There's something very fascinating about timekeeping contraptions. I've made quite a few myself, but I have to admit I have great trouble making them very reliable. And when I actually need to know the time, I look for the nearest quartz watch. It's easy to forget just how clever these little things are, particularly because you hardly ever need to do anything to them. And they're so accurate, they rarely even setting. So in this programme, Rex and I are going to rescue them from obscurity and look at their history and how they work. The earliest timekeeping device was simply a stick in the ground. The ancient Egyptians measured the angles of the shadows it cast and the Greeks measured their length. This may seem rather crude, but people didn't usually need to know the time very accurately. It was usually quite good enough just to have some idea how much daylight was left. And the stick does have the enormous advantage, like the quartz watch in fact, that it never needs setting. The Greeks and Romans also had water clocks, but these were mostly okay. just bowls with a hole in. Clock started. They were used as timers for rationing irrigation water. That's it! Time's up! Oh, that's right. My campus is hardly dampus. They were also used in the courts for timing the speeches. Unscrupulous senators are said to have gone to great lengths to make their opponents thirsty to shorten the speeches. The first people to attach any great importance to accurate timekeeping were the medieval monks. They had up to nine services a day, and it was considered vital to hold them at precisely regular intervals. At first, these intervals were set by water clocks, but at some point in the late 13th century, the first mechanical clocks appeared. Initially, they didn't bother with dials. The important part was the bell, which summoned the brethren to prayer. Our word clock comes from the French cloche, meaning bell. This particular clock is one of the oldest still working in a church. It's about 400 years old. Although it obviously doesn't look at all like a quartz watch, the principles on which it works are really remarkably similar. If I take a quartz watch to bits, you can see there are basically four parts inside. There's the display, the battery, the silicon chip, which is under this blob of plastic, and this little tin can that contains the actual quartz crystal. It's actually a lot easier to understand how one of these things works by looking at the clock in a bit more detail first. The display is obviously doing the same thing as the dial on the clock, and the battery powering the watch is doing the same thing as the weights in the clock tower, but also the crystal is actually providing a regular beat in very much the same way as the swings of the pendulum, and the silicon chip is controlling the whole thing just like the gearing. The heart of the gearing mechanism is the escapement, which interacts with the pendulum. It pushes the pendulum to keep it swinging. At the same time, the escapement is held back by the pendulum, regulating the clock's speed. The properties of the pendulum were discovered by Galileo in 1590. To mask the pong of the peasant congregation, the priests used a swinging censer to fill the church with incense. Galileo realised that the censer was taking exactly the same time to swing from side to side, however far out it went. He had trained as a doctor and used his pulse to time the swings. Galileo was in need of an accurate clock for some of his astronomy observations. 
So he simply set up a swinging weight in his observatory and paid a man to count its swings all the time. Ma! Cosa fai? The solution to this problem was to fit the pendulum to a mechanical clock. And this has remained the basis of clockwork ever since. This is the escapement wheel and pendulum of a water clock on building for Felixstowe Town. The water acts like the weight on the church clock, pushing the escapement wheel round. The escapement interacts with the pendulum in the same way. No matter how far the pendulum swings, it always takes the same time. The only way to alter it is to raise or lower the weight. It's not obvious how a lump of quartz could possibly do the same thing as a pendulum, but it really is quite similar. The quartz does move. This is a bit of crystalline material similar to quartz sandwiched between two bits of metal. And if I connect this up, I think you should be able to see it move. The electricity is making the quartz distort. This was discovered by Pierre and Marie Curie in the 1880s and called the piezoelectric effect. In the watch, it's used to make the crystal vibrate. Here I've cut a crystal out of its tin can and under a magnifying glass I think you can see it's cut in the shape of a tiny tuning fork. It vibrates in exactly the same way as an actual tuning fork. These vibrations have a stable natural frequency just like the swings of the pendulum. Though in the quartz crystal the movement's much too small and fast to be visible. The piezoelectric effect also works in reverse. So if I distort this cylinder of crystalline material by squashing it, it actually creates some electricity. Uh, this is uh, actually the crystal out of a piezoelectric gas lighter, uh, and this is how these things work. This is also used in the watch. The battery powers the chip and keeps the crystal vibrating. This vibration creates stable electrical pulses which are fed back to the chip, interacting in a similar way to the pendulum and escapement. The chip then powers the display. Although this basic idea of a bit of vibrating quartz is really quite simple, it's only recently replaced clockwork, which had been continuously refined ever since its first monastic appearance in the 14th century. This collection is in Bury St Edmunds and the curator is Lord Middleton. Well, from the early church clocks, the clocks quickly became much more elaborate and more lavishly mm -hmm. decorated. When did the first portable mechanical watches or clocks? Around about the year 1450, mm. and by Peter Henlein. This is an example of one. You can see it's a fairly sizable <laughs> machine. Not exactly portable, you have to have a very tough pocket to put it in. You obviously couldn't fit uh, pendulums and a weight in a thing like that, though, could you? Uh, no, you couldn't. No, no that, 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 that would be ridiculous. Um, no, these were spring-driven. This one here, for example, is a spring-driven clock. There is a false pendulum on it. We set it ticking. In fact, it's, it, it's not really a pendulum, it's just a balance. But the other thing about it is amazingly thick they are. The spring is inside the barrel mm. here. And uh, they work reasonably well, but... Again, I, I, you'd have to check it every so often with the sundial. It's the frequency of sundials in every church, I'm certain, because of uh, you know, people needing to alter their watches. Is, is the jewelled one, would that be a, a lady's watch? Or, uh... No, I think it's big enough for a gentleman's watch. I mean, ladies did wear watches like this. They used to wear them on a long chain around the neck. Watches like this were obviously very expensive and could only be bought by very rich people. The first really cheap mass-produced clocks and watches started being made in America in the 1840s. The one over here, which I like particularly because um, it's rather splendid, it has a railway timekeeper written all over it. Uh, it's a sure sign of really poor quality. Um, I don't know how American railways were run, but they, well, they run on time. But if they were run on, according to watches like this, they've never gone anywhere. Not only could ordinary people start to afford a watch, with the coming of factories and railways, they actually needed one. 
always leave plenty of time to catch a train. But However, watches were still oh, set no. by sundials, so the time was slightly different in every town. Look at my mum. I know my watch is right, so why is the train gone? The train left on time, sir. Oh, no, no, no. I should have five minutes at least. What's happening? Well, your watch is on local time, you see. And we run on railway time here. Train left when it should have done. You, you let the train go early! Now get it, Wolfie! Oh! oh. 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 The idea of wristwatch is surprisingly recent. They first became popular among artillery officers during the First World War. It was a considerable technical feat to miniaturise all the parts to this extent. Mechanical wristwatches are among the most sophisticated mechanisms ever made and have always been regarded as treasured possessions. Oh, just wait till the gang sees this. Hey, kids, come on running. Oh, it's just perfectly perfect. And so are you, both of you, Mom and Dad. Well, Sally, you're our big girl now. Mother and I wanted our present to tell you just how proud we are of you. Today it may seem obvious that electronics provides a simpler way to miniaturise the watch. But it wasn't until the 60s that all the parts became small enough to make the idea practical. This is the first electric watch introduced by the Hamilton Watch Company in America in 1956. Inside, it doesn't really look very different from an ordinary mechanical watch. There's a little balance wheel, but there's a tiny electromagnet on it which keeps it moving backwards and forwards. The really remarkable thing was making a battery this small, though most of the development work on this was done by the military, mainly for use by spies and their radios. The next electric watch to appear was far more rev revolutionary. This is the Bulliver Accutron. It's got two tiny electromagnets you can see here. At the third stroke, it will be 4, 37 and 50 seconds. The Bulliver Accutron uses a new electronic timekeeping principle, a tuning fork. Listen. A tuning fork to give you accuracy to within a minute a month guaranteed. Never bet against a Bulliver Accutron, the most accurate watch you can buy. You can see this easier on this uh, Bulliver clock. Um, if I pop a battery in, I think you'll be able to see the tuning fork here start to vibrate. This really is an exact mechanical equivalent of the quartz watch. The idea of using quartz was nothing new. The first quartz clock had been developed as early as 1929 in the prolific Bell Labs that also invented the transistor in the 40s. But these quartz clocks, like this German one, use much larger bits of quartz, that's the quartz crystal down the bottom, and rather bulky electronics. This is the uh, first true quartz watch, introduced in 1967 by the Japanese firm Seiko. The Americans then regained the lead and uh, the Hamilton Watch Company then introduced the Pulsar. This is the first solid state watch with no moving parts. These are rotary watches. This one has a traditional Swiss movement and a very handsome face. This is a rotary quartz watch, devastatingly accurate. This is a quartz watch too, but it's like a little computer. You press this little button and look. First the time, then the day and date, and then the seconds. Very clever. It'll look smashing on your wrist. Rotary every time. The bright red displays on the first digital watches used so much power that they could only be switched on occasionally when you actually needed to know the time. The first watch to... Um, have a liquid crystal display was uh, this one. This uses so little power that the display could be left running. This uh, doesn't work anymore. The early liquid crystals were rather unstable. Today this problem has been solved and liquid crystals have been made to do some quite remarkable things. Whole windows like this are being developed.
This is a bottle of liquid crystal. It's actually a liquid. And the watch display is made by sandwiching it between two bits of glass. Um, I've clipped them in here and uh, put a drop of liquid on top. It'll slowly seep, it, seep into the gap. Oops. Whop, whop up the surplus. Um, now, these two bits of glass are coated with a square of a transparently thin metallic layer that can conduct electricity. So if I now, um, whoops, connect it up, uh, one on the top here, and uh, one on the side, it doesn't appear to do, it doesn't appear to do anything at all. What we need to make a complete display is um, a pair of Polaroid sunglasses. If I hold one lens behind the other and rotate it, you can see it goes from light to dark. Well, if I now um, put the uh, sunglasses in the clip as well, one lens in front of the sandwich um, and uh, one lens behind, like that, and now I connect it up again, you should be able to see the electricity has the effect of polarising the liquid crystal material. I can show you just how little electricity this uh, needs to make it work. If I hold on to one wire, simply touch, touching the cell with my other hand is enough to make it work, although it's, the electricity has got to pass through the resistance of my body. To make the complete watch display, the metallic film is simply split up into segments, each of which can be separately connected. This liquid crystal display is all still connected up, but of course it's completely invisible until the Polaroids are in place. And a real watch display also needs a bit of aluminium behind to reflect the light. The chip in a quartz watch is equally ingenious. Here we've made up part of the circuit in separate stages. The first one keeps the crystal vibrating. This one divides the output from the crystal to give a pulse every second. This one counts the pulses. You can see the lights coming on in sequence. Finally, this one converts the count to a random-looking array of lights. Arranged in the right places, though, these create the familiar digital numbers. The idea of a digital display wasn't new. It had appeared several times in the clock's history. This is an illuminated night clock from the 18th century. Electromechanical digital clocks started becoming popular in the 1960s. But although digital displays tell the time very clearly, they do still have their drawbacks. is uh, 5.49 and then if I be there by about 6.02 it won't start before then, but then leave me with 13, 13, no, no, it must be 13 minutes. Excuse me, madam, I wonder if you could tell me what time it is. Yes, love, it's 10 to 6. 10 to 6? Oh, good heavens! Today, dial watches are back in fashion, but now they're all quartz controlled. The crystal, the battery and the electronics are almost the same as in the digital watch. 
but now there's a tiny electric motor driving the hands round instead of the liquid crystal display. Although the quartz watch is very accurate, it is still affected by temperature. I set two watches to exactly the same time a few hours ago and I put one in a low oven. If I take it out again now, um, it looks a bit of a mess. <clears throat> Let's take this bit of plastic off. And the liquid crystal display goes completely black. It stops working above a certain temperature. But I think if I, if I leave it to cool down now, you should be able to see that the um, quartz has been affected by the heat and they no longer tell the same time. Of course, watches don't usually get quite so hot, but even small day-to-day -day temperature variations do mount up. Keeping the quartz crystal at a precise, even temperature greatly increases the accuracy. This is a device for timing the accuracy of watches, and it has to be accurate to a hundredth of a second a day. It still works by quartz, but there's a tiny heating element inside which keeps the crystal at a very even temperature. I'm going to use it to compare the accuracy of a mechanical watch, a quartz watch. This is one of the most accurate mechanical watches ever made. It cost £8,000 and it is a work of art. If I put it on the block... I have to wait uh, a few seconds before it starts to read. And you have to average several readings. Over about a minute I worked out that this one was averaging about two seconds a day fast. Now if I compare this with a one pound quartz watch, it's on a different setting, you can see this is averaging less than a second a day fast. In general, quartz watches can be about 10 times more accurate than mechanical ones. Some time ago, I bought a cheap digital watch from a filling station. And it worked perfectly for about four months, and then the battery failed. So I sat about to repair it and realised that the cheap plastic case was actually physically welded together and there was no way you could actually get at the works. So I sat about it with a hot scalpel blade and halved the watch and I eventually got to the watch compartment and found that the replacement battery I'd got was much larger than the original. So I then had to modify the inside of the watch to accommodate the new battery and that meant making new contacts for it, etc. And eventually I got it together took about two and a half, three hours and the watch worked perfectly and I was very pleased, very satisfied. It's lovely repairing something which was never designed to be repaired but unfortunately my satisfaction didn't last very long. The following day the strap broke so I had to throw it away, much to the amusement of everyone in the workshop. I have to admit I don't wear a watch myself but in comparison with my own clumsy timekeepers it's impossible not to admire the things. There really is something very satisfying and elegant about the way they work. It's a shame really, they cost so little. This one only costs 60p. The people seem to regard them as almost totally disposable. Watches certainly aren't the treasured possessions they once were. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> Wasn't it shut before? I thought...